channel top on food travels today i'm going to share with you guys the jewel cave which is one of their tourist destination here in perth australia and by the way uh before you enter to the cave you're going to have your interest fee which is i forgot how much it is and by the way there's a souvenir that you can buy also there and then also coffee that if if you want to drink coffee and hope you enjoyed my vlog for today please don't forget to subscribe like and share my videos and if you have any question please comment below thank you man-made entrance into Jewel, which they made in 1959. Now the natural entrance, it's a little bit obvious today, it is actually above us here. Now feel free to come down towards it if you want to look up, but don't get too wet. Uh, this is what we refer to as a solution pipe. 
Now, the wind as we came into the cave, did anyone feel a slight breeze? Yeah. So that is natural. It comes from atmospheric pressure systems trying to align with the inside of the cave here. As the air blows in and out, the same wind used to come out of this hole. Heavy trees rustling, they called the area the windy hole in the bush. Now, it's quite a clever name, I reckon. Uh, it wasn't until 1957, we have the first written records of Cliff's back when passing through this chute. So he was tied to 25 metres of rope with a good friend holding the other end and lowered him down into Jewel Cave here. Now, discovering this on the far side, it was quite dark and he spent about 30 seconds in here and he went straight back up this solution pipe here. Now, a few months later, on the 12th of February, 19. 58, I almost forgot that then, 1958, first major exploration, he spent nine and a half hours in this cave system. So definitely quite a large one, took him a long time to discover here. The infrastructure itself was all built in 1959 and we opened in Boxing Day there. How this was made is a result of a tree root. To my right here, this is a lovely tree root of a carry tree which stands on our forest floor. Now, the, we would have had a tree root in this area which has died, decayed, falling out, leaving behind a rough little circular, circular shape. Now, just like we see here with water coming down, we get water and wind, erosion occurs, this area gets larger and larger, and this creates our solution pipe in the cave system. Now, the cave itself, for most of it, is inactive, so most of our formations don't continue to grow, and you'll notice we don't have our lovely lake at the base here main entrance of water would actually be through this solution pipe here. We get our heavy rains and some of it can run into this cave. Looking out across the chamber itself, a few of our calcite formations. Along your roof, we have stalactites. Easy to remember, they hold on nice and tight. On the floor, stalactites. They might grow until they reach your roof. In the middle, there's also three very long, thin formations. Does anyone know what these are called? Scrimmed. Tiny milk shake fruit. Scrimmed. Straw. Oh, gold stuff. Uh, so just like drinking straw, they're hollow on the inside, only about two to nine millimetres wide. Now, touching on a little bit of cave science, when water rains like it does today, it picks up carbon from the atmosphere and gets slightly acidic. That sits on your forest floor in organic material turns into carbonic acid there. Now being slightly acidic, as it percolates down through our ceiling, this limestone is 12 metres thick. To get through this solution pipe, you do an 18 metre zigzag equal load. Now as that water percolates through, it dissolves calcium. Calcium carbonate uh, as a liquid formation is on this far side. That will run down the inside of our straw, where it grows at a very rough rate of one centimetre per century. So it is definitely quite slow. That central straw is 5.43 metres long, easily over half a million years old there. Now the limestone wall over this side as well, what we're looking at here might just look like a whole pile of Altamila limestone, although we can see three very distinctive sand dunes. How our limestone here is formed, the Cape Lewin Naturalist Bridge from Augusta to Yellinga, is over a series of ice age periods. Now you get the ice age, your shore drops back, sand is exposed to wind, blows onto land and it creates sand dune. Now our first sand dune from the floor to this level, where we can see a bit of a brown layer here. This is organic material and tannin, which has stained your limestone. We then get our second ice age and our second layer of organic material there. Our third ice age has actually formed our ceiling above us. So we stand in three ice ages worth of sand and crushed up seashell, blows onto land and cement down to form tomato limestone here. Now, that was probably a whole lot of information, but when you're ready, walk down the stairs and you'll head to that next platform.
the seagull sitting on top of the rock. Now, because this is nice and cylindrical in shape, we can do some maths to figure out the volume and then the weight of this formation. If one little car weighed about one tonne, how heavy do we think this calcite is? It's more than, yeah, it's very close. <laughs> 24. <laughs> 24. Oh, what a good answer. So 24 tonnes for this totem pole here. Now, if we turn around and look behind us, we get a much, much larger formation. Completely different in size there, but similar to our stalagmite, we refer to this as flowstone. As your water comes into the cave and flows over the edge, deposits your successive thin layers. Almost looks like it's cascading down the side here or slightly like dripping lights. Using your best imagination though, we will point out a few formations which hopefully you can make out. On the left, we might notice some tall trees like a carry forest. Yes. And we refer to this as a carry platform. On the back wall, some little jellyfish. And if we're hungry, just for the kids, a bit of broccoli. <laughs> now if you're really creative, you get a bit of a funny looking ogre's face and we've got an eye, a nose, a mouth and an ear. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's true. Now the reason that most of this calcite here appears slightly brown or dark in colour, as well as tannins, it's dirt and dust brought through from our tree roots above. Now taking your time to come down the end here, sorry, uh, we get this formation here we refer to as our frozen waterfall, which is much cleaner white glowstone there. Now Cliff, the gentleman who we say discovered the cave here, his daughter actually got married standing down there in 1980 and her daughter Kirsten got married on that top platform in 2006 there. But when you're ready, we'll head down some more stairs. Do you do that anymore? No, um, so we, I don't think they really would have anyway, but Cliff was like, my daughter, my cave, my yeah, rules. Fair enough. Um, so definitely wouldn't ever happen on no. the cave again. There might be some very special circumstances we might allow someone to get married on a platform. is to imitate what it was like for Chris Backman discovering the area. Now coming down into this cave and shining his torch into the water, reflecting quite nicely up onto this wall here. Maybe not as blue, but just as sparkly. in the cave, both were just under a kilometre in length. Now we refer to this as our flat roofed cavern, noticing a flat roof the whole way. This doesn't open up, you were certainly quite a brave person coming through this cave. Now in 1970 they say our 50 year drought began and we had a 21.6% decrease in rainfall for the region. What that meant is just like
thin and fragile straws with about a two and a half kilo raft eye or dog tooth spar on the base there. Now these ones I do find quite clever. We can see the straw at the back very thin, looks like it's fraying like a piece of rope. Now being at least 300,000 years old here and supporting that weight, calcite isn't that much stronger than your fingernail. Now on a scale of 1 to 10 the most scale, how strong is a crystal? If your fingernail was a crystal, it's about a 2.9. A diamond is a 10. Calcium, uh, calcium carbonate comes in at about a 3.2. So it's not overly strong, although vertically it will support its weight, not falling due to gravity there. The main risk of crystals breaking in the cave is always that horizontal movement, which is most commonly human touch. Now, if we were to have a big rock slide in the cave and the ground were to tremble as well, that would make quite a few of these small ones shatter. So quite easy to see them out of the sides of our straws. And these ones typically do whatever they feel. They could grow up and down, left or right, and even wrap back to attach to themselves. For these ones to form, you require quite a high humidity and very low airflow. It occurs when the water cracks the side of the straw. Once it cracks the straw, the water droplet sits externally where it'll degas, release off carbon, eventually dripping off, depositing only about seven molecules of calcite there. Now, another nice colourful formation up this way are our honeycomb or our caramel shells. These ones looking wet and sparkly, although they would be dry to touch there. We have some nice white shells here as well, looking like thin sheets of paper and the very scary ghost or Dumbledore on the back wall. <laughs> now, when you're ready, you're going to go up this staircase through a tunnel, down a staircase, a whole pile of left and right. Don't worry about getting lost because there's only one way lit up with lights there. When you get to the... Oh, so they're not going to touch it. That's why. <laughs> That's why they put this one, so that no one will touch it. Because if you touch it, it would die. Die already. Body oils when we touch these 
gives them a bit of an oily or a slimy film, which really reduces that surface tension. Now, as well as zero light, we will experience zero sound and you won't be able to hear or see pretty much anything. When I do that, I'll just ask that you turn off your phones and your watches and your cameras just so that there's no screens on. And if we've got a Tinkerbell, we attempt to show you Peter Pan, but Peter Pan doesn't look any good at all. So you've got to use your best imagination. And he is up here, maybe just a hat and a hand. You all laugh, but I also laugh because I don't really see it. I can. You can see it, oh, as long as I've got one, yes. Oh, we're back. Okay. I think we're done. Seconds, maybe keep them off for like a minute. Thank you. So, it is getting dark, everyone. Apologies. What do you think? <laughs> Now, if you wave your hand around in front of your face, there's maybe a few things going, but you're not meant to be able to see it from in the face, but most commonly that is your imagination there. When you dart your eyes really quickly, left, right, left and right, you might notice flashing on your periphery. Again, the flashing isn't there. It is just a part of your imagination again. So being a little lost animal in here, if you are falling down that solution pipe, you can understand now why you didn't make it out of the cave. It was a little bit of an unfortunate place to end up here. <coughs> Again, the discovering the caves so in the early 1900s there, like Lake and Mammoth in the region, they were all done by candlelight, being much more active, singular drop of water on your candle, and this is what you are going to do here. So, not my cup of tea, probably coming through here with the candle. That was sun and lights turning on. <laughs> now, thank you all for coming today, guys. When you're ready, we do just catch our breath up on the stairs and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> Here you are, guys, and all finished. See you in my next one. Applause at the end.